What would you do if you found out that everything you know, everything you believe, everything you've been told since you were a child was a lie? And not just any lie, but one that carefully crafted, finely tuned, expertly executed, and deliberately designed with the express purpose of assuring you that wrong was right, that bad was good, and that violence was love. A lie powerful enough to manipulate you into taking part in horrific and barbaric acts that you would otherwise find appalling. Powerful enough to wash blood from your hands, to alter your perspective so severely that murder appears mundane and compassion appears extreme. Hello, my name is Emily Moran Barwick. I'm an animal liberation activist, an artist, an educator, and a vegan. I created the YouTube channel and website, Bite Size Vegan, where I educate people about veganism through a wide array of video styles, from humorous parodies to detailed academic reports to interviews with physicians and athletes to vegan videos for children while covering a diverse range of subject matter. In our time together today, I will very likely challenge some of your lifelong beliefs. I'm going to ask you to set your preconceptions aside and try to look at the ordinary with a fresh set of eyes. I'm aware that this is a great deal to ask from you, especially coming from a total stranger. I'm asking for your trust, and I haven't even earned it. But believe it or not, I am not here to force my beliefs upon you or to make you go vegan. I don't pretend to have that power, and nobody makes any lasting change through force anyways. I'm simply here to show you what is going on every second of every day all around the world behind closed doors, to present evidence for your consideration that things may not be as they appear. Undoing lifelong beliefs is no easy task, but in order for us to make informed decisions, to look ourselves in the mirror and ask if we are truly living the values that we purport to have, we must know the truth. We must educate ourselves about what is really going on and not rely on what we've been taught. We must base our decisions on facts and not fantasy. I want to preface this talk by saying that I'm going to be transparent with you, and I'll even tell you if I don't know something. I'm also going to be providing you with a link to a resource sheet that has every fact that I state cited, as well as a bibliography, so that you can dig deeper, because I'm only going to be able to barely scratch the surface in the brief time that we have together. So let's get started. Veganism is viewed as an extreme way of living. Vegans do not eat, wear, or use anything that came from someone else's body. We don't eat meat or drink milk or eat cheese. We don't consume eggs or honey. We don't wear leather, wool, silk, or down. We don't use products that were tested on animals or contain byproducts from their slaughter. And we don't attend circuses, zoos, aquariums, or any other event that exploits living beings for our entertainment and pleasure. From the outside, such rigorous exclusions and avoidances can easily appear extreme. But remember that today is about challenging appearances and assumptions of extremism and normality. Today is a lesson in unlearning. And what better way to unlearn than to start our journey at the end and work our way back to the beginning? And what better way to question what's accepted as good and normal than with something as wholesome and everyday as a glass of milk? The source of milk is no big secret. It comes from cows. But that's about as far back as most people trace milk's journey to our refrigerated grocery cases. Most of us grow up thinking that cows are made to be milked. We may think that they have a constant supply of milk, or even that they need to be milked to relieve pressure. Well, let's look at this critically for a moment. Cows are mammals, just like us, and mammals produce milk for one reason, 
to feed their babies. Cows carry their babies for nine months, just like we do. They lactate to feed their babies, just like we do. And after weaning, they stop producing milk, just like we do. So in order to have a constant supply of cow's milk for human consumption, we need a constant supply of pregnant cows. In the dairy industry, cows are repeatedly inseminated, which is a nice word for raped. The restraining apparatus used to secure the cows is literally referred to within the dairy industry, at least in America, as a rape rack. So this is not a term dreamed up by vegan activists. Once a cow gives birth, we face another roadblock to our milk's journey. Babies, after all, drink their mother's milk. So to make sure there's a constant supply of milk for us, the babies must be taken away soon after birth. And this is precisely what occurs in the dairy industry. If the calf is male, he is sent to a veal farm where he is tied down, unable to move, or locked in a cage where he cannot even turn around until he's slaughtered when he's only a few weeks old. Veal, an industry that even many meat eaters oppose, would not exist without dairy. Every cup of yogurt, every scoop of ice cream, and every glass of milk is directly connected to the deaths of those baby calves. But we're not quite done tracing milk's path to our cereal bowls. While the slaughter of babies is certainly horrific enough, we cannot forget the mothers who are left behind. Cows bond intensely with their calves, and they will cry out for days when they are taken. When residents of Newbury, Massachusetts, called the police to report disturbing noises emanating from Sunshine Dairy Farms at all hours of the day and night, the police explained that the mother cows were lamenting the separation from their calves. But not to worry, as the cows are not in distress and that the noises are a normal part of farming practices. This is not anthropomorphizing. It's a mother's grief, and it's absolutely heartbreaking to watch. The bodies of dairy cows generally give out around age four or five, and they are regarded as spent, despite the natural lifespan of 20 years or more. They're sent for slaughter, for cheap meats and pet foods, and deemed unfit for human consumption. At the slaughterhouse, many of these mothers face their final and most brutal separation from yet another child. While formal statistics are difficult to obtain as most studies focus on the economic cost of fetal wastage, accounts range from approximately 10 to 70 percent of cows arriving at the slaughterhouse pregnant. In fact, there are entire industries that rely upon the slaughter of pregnant animals. A wide array of scientific experiments use what is called fetal serum from a range of animals, with bovine fetal serum being the most widely utilized. Bovine fetal serum is obtained by cutting a living fetus out of the mother's womb, piercing the heart, and draining the blood. The process can take up to 35 minutes while the fetal calf remains alive. But this most horrific and final separation of mother and child was just the last in a cycle of pregnancy after pregnancy and loss after loss. In addition to this extreme psychological and emotional trauma, the physical demands of repeated milkings and the crowded and unsanitary living conditions lead to frequent infections and sores. Dairy cows are pumped full of antibiotics and growth hormones, all of which seep into their milk. In fact, there is an official allowable number of pus cells in milk, euphemistically referred to as the somatic cell count. In the United States, around 22 million pus cells are allowed per single ounce of milk, with global allowable limits ranging from just under 12 million to 29.5 million. When we push onwards through our dairy cow's beginning, back past the first pregnancy, before she became the broken, hollowed-out shell eventually collapsing under the insane demands of her short life, we come to her birth, the moment she emerges into the world, wide-eyed and brand new, the moment that she was taken from her own mother. You see, we talked about what happened to the male calves who are sent off for veal. 
Well, the daughters of the dairy industry are still separated from their mothers, but they're kept around to take their mother's place, to keep the money machine going and keep the milk flowing, so that every grocery store, every corner shop, every gas station will be sure to stock this wholesome, normalized, entirely ordinary product. The animal products that we perceive as mundane when reverse engineered reveal a perversely complex and, to put it lightly, ethically challenging journey from genesis through processing and production to the end product. And that is to say, from the animal's birth through confinement, abuse, slaughter, denigration of corpses to the shiny, happy, store-ready products that we literally eat up without even a single thought as to what the animals went through. We are being sold the pus-filled ultimate outcome of rape, enslavement, kidnapping, abuse, disease, torture, infanticide, and murder whitewashed into an image of wholesome nutrition. As vegan activist Gary Yarofsky has said, it is the greatest magic trick ever performed. And people say veganism is extreme. Unfortunately, or you might feel at this point fortunately, we don't have the time to take this reverse journey in such depth with all of the products that we create from living beings. But let's just take an abridged look at another seemingly harmless item, one consumed all over the world and with which most Americans start their day, one that is lovingly mixed into baked goods for birthdays and other special occasions. One decorated in celebration of peace and new life. The incredible edible egg. Like milk, the source of eggs is clear. They come from chickens. And unlike milk, chickens do not have to be impregnated to supply them. But any time we make a living being into a machine, a supplier of inventory, the bottom line will always be profit. And increasing profit means increasing output and increasing efficiency. Just like the mothers of dairies, the body of layer hens give out prematurely from the extreme demands of production. Hens lose vital nutrients every time their bodies form an egg. Every aspect of their lives is regulated to ensure maximum output. From controlling their laying cycles with days and days of persistent light, followed by long periods of complete darkness, to starving them for weeks at a time to force yet another egg cycle from their worn out bodies, a process benignly referred to as induced molting, to the outright manipulation of their very genetic makeup. We've optimized our machines, you see, and we've bred one kind of chicken for meat and another kind for eggs. Because of this, the egg industry produces millions if not a billion unwanted male baby chicks every year. Just like the male dairy calves who are unable to produce milk, the male layer chicks can't lay eggs, so they are of no use. To dispose of, as they say, these baby chicks, they are either painfully gassed, slowly suffocated in plastic bags, or they are ground up alive, which is referred to as maceration within the industry. We're talking about the cute, fluffy, yellow baby chicks that we adore come Easter time. This is standard practice all over the world with the United States and the European Union specifying that chicks must be less than 72 hours old when they are killed. They're not even granted three days of life. The sisters of the egg industry's discarded sons get to live out their short lives in cramped battery cages, unable to even extend their wings. Of course, nowadays, we hear about the rise of free-range and cage-free facilities. But in truth, the only comfort that these labels bring is to our own conscience. Cage-free birds are crammed into tiny sheds and have twice the mortality rate of battery-raised hens. Layer hens are generally good for one to three cycles, each lasting roughly a year. In countries where induced molting, which is again the industry term for starvation, is illegal, they are simply killed on their first birthday. I hope you're starting to see the power of this lie, of presenting 
Cruel confinement, starvation, abuse, the barbaric murder of day-old babies, and the slaughter of one-year-olds, themselves still children, as something completely normal and kind, packaged in perfect little orbs. And we have the audacity to decorate them in celebration of new life, to fawn over the very chicks who were ground up alive for their production, to mix them into treats for our children and our loved ones, to start our day with the products of abject misery and call it sunny side up. We might as well start our day by throwing chicks in a blender. We could spend all week reverse engineering the paths of the seemingly endless number of animal-derived products that we encounter on a regular basis. In fact, Dutch artist Christine Mendiertsma spent three years tracing and cataloging all of the products made from a single pig, pig 05049. Which brings us to the next layer of our collective self-deception, the systematic erasure of individual identity. You see, this is where the lie is most vulnerable. Because beneath the years of indoctrination, we still believe ourselves to be animal lovers. We go to the movies and we root for Babe. We cheer for the chickens of Chicken Run. We pull for Nemo the fish to find his way back to his father. And then we go home and we eat bacon and eggs and we make chicken fingers and fish sticks for the kids. The only way for us to maintain this glaring dissonance, this duality of our professed values and our daily actions, is to ensure that the animals we eat and use have no names, no faces, and no identities. So we give them inventory numbers. We brand them with hot irons or freeze off their skin. We tattoo them and tag them, inject electronic transponders below their skin or strap them to their necks and ankles. We even give them barcodes. The most important thing is that they are clearly identified as property and they are treated as such. Because as soon as we see them as individuals, we threaten the very foundation of the lie upon which we so desperately depend. If their bodies don't conform to our desires, we alter them at will. Baby pigs have their teeth cut out, their ears notched, and their tails cut off, and their testicles ripped out, all without anesthetic. Chickens, turkeys, and other birds in the meat and egg industries have their sensitive beaks cut or seared off. Cows have their horns cut or burned off and are also castrated without anesthetic. And with some of the most impressive mental gymnastics, which would be admirable if it wasn't so horrific, we say that this barbaric mutilation, this conversion of living beings from some ones to some things, is for their own good. Because if, if we don't clip their teeth or cut their beaks or slice off their tails, they'll attack and chew on each other. What we fail to mention is that these behaviors are stress responses to confinement in overly crowded, insanity-inducing conditions. If we didn't put them in these abusive conditions, they wouldn't react the way that they do. But we humans love to play the role of savior in the disasters of our own creation. We swoop in to milk the cow and relieve the painful pressure of her swollen udder, pressure that would not exist had we not taken her child away. And to top it all off, we amass mountains of paperwork, conduct thousands of studies, spend untold amounts of money form government, institutional, and industry panels, all to decide, define, and decree the right way to kill. You can pour through the documents from the USDA or the European Union or any country for that matter, learn the legal speak that makes taking the life of a living being acceptable. And you don't have to look that far to start finding caveats and loopholes. Religious slaughter without any form of stunning gets a pass. Birds and fish are excluded from humane slaughter regulations, the very name of which is a perfect illustration of our desperate attempt to simultaneously be animal lovers and animal killers, to be their protectors and their tormentors. I mean, it's really absurd when we step back and think about it. Do we have manuals on how to humanely rape? 
or how to compassionately kidnap or ethically rob? Of course not. These are oxymorons. They cannot coexist. But when it comes to killing animals, we will bend over backwards and create massive paper trails of regulations to feel good about what it is we are doing. Again, I must ask, is veganism really the extreme choice here? Look at what we have to go through to make eating animals acceptable. Before we move into issues of the environment and the health impacts of diet, I'm going to play a very brief video. Portions of the footage where the location is known will be labeled as such, but that doesn't mean that it, the same thing is not happening in other parts of the world. I trimmed down hours of footage into a three minute clip. It will not be pleasant, but I would implore you to watch anyways or at least listen and stay for the remaining aspects of the talk. You can't make an informed decision without having all of the facts. If you do feel that you must turn away, I would just ask you to think on the question. If I can't watch the process, do I have a right to eat the product? In my many years of being vegan and speaking with many, many non-vegans, I have yet to ever hear one reason that even comes close to justifying putting a sentient being through what we just saw. Not one. You cannot watch that and say that the animals that we kill for our food don't know any better, that they die peacefully and humanely. They can sense the fear, they can smell the blood, and they fight, they fight to the end. And you can't say that it's happening in some faraway place because it's happening all over the world. The CO2 chambers that you saw, those were the medieval devices lowering pigs to an extraordinarily painful death of burning from the inside out. That is seen as the most humane method of slaughtering pigs. It's employed worldwide, including here in the United States. I know I focused rather exclusively thus far on the ethical truths behind the mask of normality. But the wake of our destruction is littered with far more than the trillions of beings that we kill every year. The environmental, health, and social impact of what we put in our mouths is astounding. And there's no way I'm going to be able to cover all of these areas today in the depth that they deserve. So I do encourage you, again, to refer to the resource page I'll be leaving you with. But let's try to take a bird's eye view of our impact on this planet. When it comes to the environment, we hear about conserving water, cutting down on emissions, halting deforestation. Environmental protection agencies encourage us to take shorter showers, carpool or ride our bikes, go paperless and recycle more. Our governments hold international conferences to address climate change and seek solutions, all the while the single most devastating force behind our planet's environmental collapse remains not only unspoken, but actually actively denied by the very organizations charged with saving our planet. Animal agriculture is the leading cause of climate change. It's responsible for up to 51% of greenhouse gas emissions compared to the 13% of all global transportation. It uses a third of the Earth's fresh water, up to 45% of the Earth's land. It's responsible for 91% of Amazon rainforest destruction with one to two acres cleared every second. It's also a leading cause of species extinction, ocean dead zones, and habitat destruction. The efforts that we make to recycle and take shorter showers are rather insignificant in comparison. 
accounting for variation in production systems, the global average water footprint for a single pound of beef is 1,847 gallons, with numbers ranging all the way up to 8,000 gallons. We can see here that without fail, those food products with the smallest water footprint by weight are plant-based. Of course, weight doesn't necessarily mean sustenance, but still, global averages show that when viewed from a caloric standpoint, the water footprint for animal products is larger than for crop products with the average water footprint per calorie of beef being 20 times larger than for cereal and starchy roots. And with protein being one of the greatest nutrition concerns for people considering veganism, it's worth noting that the water footprint per gram of protein of milk, eggs, and chicken meat is about one and a half times larger than that for pulses, and beefs is six times larger, leading to the conclusion that it is more efficient to obtain calories protein, and fat through crop products than animal products. But we don't really need studies to tell us that eating animals requires more energy input and creates more waste than eating plants. How can it not? Eating animals is incredibly inefficient. We are filtering our nutrients, our water, our resources through somebody else's body. Globally, we feed close to 40% of our grains to our food animals. How can that not be worse for the environment than simply eating the plants ourselves? The United States alone could feed 800 million people with the grain we feed to our livestock. That's more than the estimated 795 million people going hungry in the world today. 98% of the massive water footprint that we just covered for animal agriculture goes to watering the feed crops that we give to our animals that we eat. Now, I'm not suggesting that a global shift to veganism will automatically result in the proper redistribution of our crops to those in need, nor address the issue of unnecessary food wastage. But it's the only way that we can have enough food to feed everyone. This is where many people point to small local farms and sustainable practices, like grass-fed beef and free-range eggs. The thing is, we don't have the land there's simply no land for the number of animals that we eat every year. The amount of land that it takes to produce 37,000 pounds of plant-based foods will only yield 375 pounds of meat. The land required to feed one vegan for one year is a sixth of an acre. It takes three times as much for a vegetarian, meaning someone consuming dairy and eggs but no meat, and 18 times as much for a meat eater. You can grow 15 times more protein on any given area of land with plants versus animals. And on top of all of that, studies show that pasture-raised cows emit 40 to 60 percent more greenhouse gases than grain-fed. I could talk about the environmental cost of animal agriculture all day and we would still only be scratching the surface. I did want to talk briefly to fishing and ocean health before we move on. I did produce a 17-minute video report encompassing the most recent research on the state of our oceans, which will also be on your resource page, but I'm just going to try to summarize some of the main takeaways. Whether you eat fish and marine life or not, this matter impacts all of us. The ocean, or rather the phytoplankton in the ocean, provides somewhere between 50 and 80 percent of our oxygen, and the ocean's ecosystems store carbon in massive quantities. Since we tend to go for the biggest fish first, only 10% of predatory fish species remain, which could leave the unchecked species to feed on the ocean's vegetation, releasing the stored carbon. Losing just 1% of the blue carbon ecosystems would be equivalent to the annual greenhouse gas emissions of Australia. We pull 90 to 100 million tons of fish from our oceans each year with some sources even estimating 150 million tons. There is no way for the marine populations to replenish themselves. And our industrial fishing methods are incredibly inefficient, with some operations throwing 98% of their catches overboard dead because they are not the target species. As I said earlier, land-based animal agriculture is the leading cause of ocean dead zones which are areas in the ocean starved of oxygen such that marine life suffocates and dies. 
So the animals that we are raising for food on land are killing the animals that we are ripping from the oceans. And to add a further layer of perversity, we are feeding the fish that we catch to the cows, pigs, chickens, and other land animals, and to the fish that we farm. And people think veganism is extreme. When humanity is decimating habitats, consuming land and resources, polluting the oceans, destroying the rainforest, driving species after species into extinction, feeding plants that we could eat to animals, and feeding other animals to animals that aren't supposed to eat animals, all so that we can eventually eat the animals ourselves. But of course, as the consumer, we don't see the trail. We see the pretty packages and the sleek advertising. We see the ordinary, innocent, everyday products, and we find comfort in the fact that most people eat the way we do. Most people don't seem to be concerned. And we continue to believe the lie that this is the way it's supposed to be. Ethics aside, we have environmentally reached the point beyond personal choice, beyond you eat how you want to eat and I'll eat how I want to eat. This is a global crisis, and it's not about you, and it's not about me anymore. We say that the children are our future, but what future can they have when we are eating the planet to death? The world cannot sustain meat, dairy, and egg production. It simply cannot. We have to start aligning our actions with our values. I'm going to speak very briefly to the impact of animal consumption on our health. We take drugs by the truckload, undergo dangerous surgeries, spend trillions of dollars on health care every year, and our stubborn refusal to acknowledge the simple fact that diet is the number one cause of disability and premature death, that the vast majority of deaths in the United States are entirely preventable if we would simply change the way that we eat. The denial of this truth is so pervasive and our desire to maintain the system that we've constructed so strong that only a quarter of medical schools in the United States even teach a single course on nutrition. The doctors in whose hands we are placing our very lives aren't even educated in the number one cause of disease and death in our country. Heart disease, the number one killer in the United States, is a dietary disease that can be and has been reversed with a vegan plant-based diet. But instead, we take handfuls of medications. We have doctors crack open our chests and rotor-rooter our arteries rather than stop eating animals. After all, a vegan diet is too extreme. Once we look at this objectively from the outside, our behavior is baffling. We serve meat, dairy, and eggs at climate change conferences, supporting and consuming the very source of the problem that the conference was created to address. We train doctors to save lives with years of expensive education covering every drug on the market while never addressing the true cause of disease. We run our resources and nutrition through someone else's body, squandering astronomical amounts of food and water and creating an astounding amount of waste. We genetically manipulate, breed, confine, abuse, rape, torture, denigrate, mechanize, and murder sentient individuals under our self-created codes of conduct that bring comfort to consumers all to avoid facing the fact that we are living the greatest lie ever told. But here's the good news. We have the power to open our eyes. We have the choice to break the cycle and refuse to sell this lie to the next generation. To realize that veganism, far from being an extreme lifestyle, is the most sane, rational way to live it's the most powerful tool that we have for saving the planet, for improving our health when we eat health consciously, and for regaining our compassion, for becoming the people that we believe ourselves to be, good people. And good people don't destroy the planet, leaving our children without a future. Good people don't throw newborn babies into grinders. Good people don't rip day-old babies away from their mothers. 
Good people don't rape, torture, and murder. Yet good people everywhere are doing all of these things with every bite of every meal. But that's the beauty here. You no longer have to buy into the lie. You decide what goes into your body. You decide whether you want to continue to have people kill for you. You decide whether you want to continue consuming death, terror, and heartbreak. You have the information at your feet. The responsibility now lies in your hands. You decide. And my hope is that you'll decide to go vegan. Thank you.